and then can become prioritized by you as a council and implemented at a staff level. So this is our draft report. Um, we identified 12 different key projects um, from the community. Starting from left to right and then north to south, uh, we looked at Gallery Square. Let me see if this works. That no, doesn't work there. Number two, up towards the top there, Village Boulevard, we heard about um, some concerns with the traffic flow and some safety issues there with the intersection of Village Boulevard and Old Dixie. Uh, there was a lot of discussion, interestingly enough, about Old Dixie, the linear park, uh, this idea of a sustainability garden. So numbers um, uh, three and four and five all kind of deal with the Old Dixie FSE corridor. There was a lot of things that were happening there. One of the things that, you know, really, I don't think we fully appreciated until we started really putting together the plan is that Old Dixie and the FEC corridor are really sort of equidistant. You know, they're really sort of the epicenter of town. You've got what is the more community center to the west of Gallery Square, but the transition happens at the tracks and happens at Old Dixie as you come into what would be downtown. Um, there's, we, we, we came up with this idea because we were out driving and saw it, this idea of a post office pavilion, which is number six there, Paradise Park, uh, a lot of attention dis and discussion about what happens with those parcels as your town center. Bridge Road, there's great opportunity to improve Bridge Road over time, and your Paradise Park then has multiple fronts of different scale and different character. Uh, Fashion Mall uh, was interesting. There's a, um, a, a proposal for that. Um, some ideas about infilling to Cuesta shops a little bit to maybe soften the edge of that large parking lot, although we know it's a very desirable uh, destination uh, for, for those in the community to shop. And then Federal Highway, we even looked at um, potential some updates to finish, if you will, the complete street project that started a number of years ago. Gallery Square, um, you know, we struggled during the charrette because, you know, we did windshield surveys of all of your retail centers in town. And your vacancy rate was, from what we could tell, virtually zero. You know, you have tremendous amount of occupancy in all of your centers. So it's kind of hard to identify which one is going to redevelop, you know what I mean? But we went ahead and, you know, looked then at uh, the age of some buildings and also, you know, what can you do to improve things over time? And one of the things, is, as beloved as Gallery Square is, it is a big parking lot and it is a strip center. And are there ways over time, um, and don't focus on the architecture so much, but are there ways over time to create, um, if that were to redevelop, um, to create a public square, a plaza, a center of town that's really more or, you know, oriented towards the neighborhoods and to the community? You would still have shops, maybe additional uh, or adding residential, but creating that formal public space. Um, that would really, I think, um, go well with what you've got here at the overall Civic Campus. Um, the, the roundabout at uh, Village Parkway in North Old Dixie, we heard that that's the, that's the preferred route for folks going to Publix. You come up, up Old Dixie, Village Parkway over, and then come in sort of on the south side, because everybody wants to avoid US-1 if they can, especially making that weird left turn going northbound, getting into to the site. Cause the, the vehicles are traveling faster on, on I think, US-1 than at least I realize a lot of times. However, this is a challenging intersection. Um, I, I know, if I remember correctly, there were some attempts to get a stoplight there, but I think the county said it wasn't warranted because of the number of trips. Um, however, there are physical things that you can do, and one of the things we discussed is possibly doing a roundabout there, which would um, not force cars to come to a complete stop, but if it's designed properly, cars have to deflect and go around, and that tends to slow them down. It also gives pedestrians that are over on the linear park and, and cyclists uh, potentially a better opportunity to get to the other side. So if I'm riding up the linear park, the FEC corridor, um, you know, cars have to slow down as they approach the, uh, the roundabout there at Village Park. Yeah, and just to correct one thing, the effort wasn't to get the stoplight there. The effort was to get the stoplight at US-1 coming where, the, where that road intersects US-1. That's where the effort was to get the stoplight, and that's where the DOT came back and said there wasn't sufficient activity at that time. Okay. I thought we did both. I thought I, thought I heard both, we've done, but... We've done both. 
Because I remember Mayor, um, former Mayor Abbey was on the Council of Chiefs. So Doug says both traffic study at both locations. Okay. And we did get the night on both. Okay. They're both bad. <laughs> um, they both need something. I, I'm surprised that the one at US1, frankly, we almost got cream coming out of there during the shred. That was the one that people were most concerned yeah. about at the time. Um, I didn't recall that we did a Dixie as well. But. And it may have been to initially look at a four way or three way stop or something at this, but it's it was brought up. I mean, we, we had no idea that this was an issue coming into the shred process itself, and it was brought up enough by the residents that you know we spent a little bit of time looking at it. And we think that. It needs to be carried forward, you know. Just keep churning out. Um, oftentimes, a roundabout is easier to get um, implemented than a full stop or a stop line. Because you know, engineers—they don't. Forgive me if there's any traffic engineers here, but they don't like to impede the flow of traffic. You know what I mean? Um, and honestly, roundabouts—you know—they circle around. Um, then you, you have a really interesting condition with the FEC linear park. And um, you know, we, we did a couple of renderings. This is that same intersection. I, this is before, you know, as we started to sketch in the roundabout there, but it didn't actually get fully realized. There are different ways to handle it. Like this would be sort of a speed table with rumble strips or a textured crosswalk surface. But you have an opportunity to create these sort of little, um, you know, entry markers or monuments or shade structures, etc., up and down. Um, this area. I realize that some of it, if not all of it, is within the FEC right of way, so there are often limitations to what you can do. Um, but there's also power lines that go back and forth, so you're competing with getting ample shade trees in there as well. And um, but it, it's a it's a great asset that you have, and we we um, we look to build upon that in a couple of different ways. This is a little ambitious. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> now again, you know, sometimes late at night, you know, our designers, <laughs> they lose themselves, right? <laughs> but honestly, what this is intended to show, this is the south side. You're looking south at the intersection of Tequesta, the tracks, and, and Old Dixie. Um, and you really have an interesting condition where if you had a pavilion and maybe a small plaza there adjacent to the FEC, that's a great sort of trailhead type of location where you could have a function there. People, there might even be some parking to the side, but a way to sort of, you know, end cap that trail system and you could have picnics or parties or things like that. It also conceals the tracks a little bit. Um, it buffers the downtown side from, from the rail tracks. But we thought it was, you know, potentially an interesting idea to look at having some sort of you know, out through, indoor outdoor facility at the end of that trail, um, right there. And it, again, like I said, this is really this this series of tracks and roadways um, is the transition from the neighborhoods into your future downtown. We also, um, because you know, <clears throat> we were criticized for the last thirty years at Treasure Coast for drawing train platforms on every charrette that we ever did that had train tracks. They're actually starting to happen, some of them. So um, while you won't ever be a candidate for a bright line station, um, in the future, you might be a candidate for what's called tri-rail coastal link, or a similar type of, of, of rail service. If you think of it this way, bright line um, is, it's a private service. It's like, it, it runs almost like the airline industry. You know, they set their own fares, they set their own schedule. Etc. Tri-rail, on the other hand, even though it's you know it's it's suffered being out on the western tracks all these years, that functions more like a public utility. So the idea is that Bright Line is the the express train that connects all the bigger cities. The the ultimate goal is the Tri-rail Coastal Link is the intermediate train that connects all the all the cities in between. So we've done um, train station master plans for cities from Broward all the way up to Delray Beach and Lake Worth. Um, so it's always good to, I think, memorialize it, whether it happens or not. You know, you know you've got the space, and this is the location where you'd want to have it. Believe it or not, even the city of Stewart, Martin County, who is suing Brightline, and they finally settled, um, they're now jockeying as to where their Brightline station is going to go in the Treasure Coast. And so there's a sort of a tug of war between, between, <laughs> between. If you haven't written it, you got to try it. Uh, between Fort Pierce and the city of Stewart. 
Um, there's this little bit of space, it's about 40 feet, that's between the tracks and the back of the buildings to the west. And that was brought up a number of times. It's village-owned property. And we heard, um, we heard a lot about that. We heard different opinions about that. Um, and we wondered if there was a way to create a hybrid situation where you could provide uh, vehicular access to the buildings behind or to the rear of those buildings, but also create a slender extension of some sort of uh, linear park back there. It is village owned. Um, it was brought up a number of times because there's been discussions, at least at the time, about whether or not to abandon that property, convey it to the adjacent owners, you know, what to do with that. And so, um, you know, we took a moment to explore what some different um, park-like options might be right there. It's, uh, it is narrow, it's only 40 feet, so there's not a whole lot you can do with it, but there's always, you're always gonna run into um, some opposition to just conveying public property because you never get it back. So are there ways to, this is simply meant to ask, are there ways to appease differing camps that you can have some sort of park-like space but also provide vehicular access to the businesses? So this is a, this is a site that nobody talked about um, except for us. Uh, because we were driving up and down Old Dixie, and we're like, well, what is this big retention area that's over here? And then we figured out that the post office is there and the library is just to the other side. Um, and so the thought was, you know, this is really a big piece of space. And while we would never recommend taking away its utilitarian function of being a retention area, you know, when it's not filled with water, it's sitting there as like a park. And so there's also parking all around the post office. So the thought was, Maybe a, a future pavilion, doesn't have to be elaborate, um, could go at the end of this thing. So what you see here is Old Dixie, and then this is that retention area, and then some sort of indoor-outdoor facility there. Again, this isn't a priority, but we saw it as an opportunity that, that you know, um, could enhance the Old Dixie Highway corridor. Because you know, as, great as, the, um, as great as the FEC trail is, that multi-purpose path, there are some areas of that corridor that are still pretty bleak. And so you might be able to get some trees in there, some planting, and actually turn that into an additional park space. Um, we always love to see, you know, retention areas that can function in multiple ways. You know, be a passive park when it's not raining and flooding and be serve its function when it is flooding. Sorry, no, it's okay. A lot of discussion about Paradise Park in the town center location. Um, Obviously, the first phase of, of the town center was, was implemented years ago. Um, right before the charrette was when um, the lease agreement, I think, was terminated, or the lease expired, excuse me, that the, that the town had with, with the owners of the parcel. Um, we actually heard during the charrette that the parcel was under um, option for sale, and we met with, with the planner of the prospective owners. Um, there are many different ways to go about trying to infill your town center area. Um, we illustrated a few different ones um, simply to illustrate principles. Uh, and the principles being this. Um, we talked a lot about how the open space requirements in your code today often aren't delivering usable, meaningful open spaces. Places that people can look at and point to and say, yeah, that's a place that um, is, is, is public and it's a, or, or it's a place for us to congregate or um, and not to mention the fact that you know Paradise Park has served as, as a passive and active recreation area or event space for so many years it sort of has the, you know, the, the memory of being the location where you go for some of these larger events be it the chili cook off or other things so what we tried to express was that whatever development came in, that there needed to be some provision of a usable, publicly accessible open space, whether it's the form of a green park, an amphitheater. The image on the right shows um, a hard plaza where you could have you know, festivals, etc. cetera. Um, if you've been to City Place or whatever they call it now, the square or some uh, down at West Palm, you know, that plaza there adjacent to the old historic Presbyterian church was a fundamental piece of the RFP. That was a, that was a, that was a, a, a non-starter. If there wasn't some publicly accessible 
urban public space there, um, the, the, the team would not have won the RFP to do the development. So it is absolutely possible, and there's precedent to get something like this done. Uh, there was some discussion during the trip, well, should it be on the Tequesta Drive side, or should it be on the Bridge Road side? Well, Tequesta Drive is your entry into town. It's your central nervous system. So really, if, you're, if you want to have that, that maximum exposure of all the great things that are happening here, having your festivals, et cetera, you know, um, Halloween, kids' Halloween costume competitions, we used to have those in West Palm at our little plaza downtown. Um, you know, you get full exposure into Cuesta Drive. That's not to say, though, that Bridge Road is an, is an important. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, maintaining the public connection between Tequesta Drive and Bridge Road is essential. That should not be negotiable at all. In fact, you should strive to get as many connections as you can. Um, and you want those buildings to frame the streets. And you want them to frame whatever public space you're creating. So when I talk about public space, uh, this was just one rendering that was done. Um, illustrating you know, two to three story buildings. Um, you've got streets that go through. You've got a little bit of green space. You've got trees. You've also got hard surface too. And that's where you can have umbrellas, outdoor seating, and again, festivals and that type of thing. And you know, 25 years ago, we didn't have any of these type of spaces in Palm Beach County. We have a number of them now that you can go look at. Um, and so I think it's, it's really important that that be part of whatever is proposed and built um, for your town center ultimately. And as I said, we showed a few different images of where that green space might go. Uh, maybe it's um, to the west of the main street. Um, it's in combination with the plaza behind that building. But clearly, there, there needs to be enough space for parking, and that the parking should be to the rear or the interior of the blocks. Notice that the building faces, the building fronts face Main Street. Um, they face the streets. And the parking, the stuff that you don't want to expose, goes on the interior. So that would be your parking and service and all of that. As I said, there's a lot of different ways to, to, to go about um, implementing this. So long as the principles are in place, you're fronting streets, you're creating public open space, um, and you're, you're concealing to the extent possible the parking and, and dumpsters and all of that. We did a little analysis. I mean, the density is 18 units per acre. Um, the minimum landscape open space is 25%. With this plan that we illustrated here, we came up with you know, exceeding that a little bit in terms of open space, number of units, et cetera. Um, these are the type of calculations that Nilsa and, and her team will do as projects come in, and they have to analyze them. Um, height is always an issue, I think, in every city that we work in. Density, not always so much. Density was an issue, as I recall, here. And there didn't seem to be the appetite to increasing density for additional open space here. We are working in Lake Worth Beach right now in their downtown historic district on Lake Lucerne. And there are some pro proposals that have come in there that have divided the community. We're recommending that they just do away with any density maximums in their downtown. This is just a six block area. Maintain the building height. Don't give away height. But what we heard over and again from developers in Lake Worth Beach is that I could only build 12 units because of the density and I've got a tiny little site. Now I have to sell them for $700,000. I'd much rather build 14 units in the same size building and make them affordable. That's something to think about. Um, you have a box that's a building and it can have four units or it could have 15 units. You know, that has everything to do with the affordability. There are other implications, parking, et cetera, things of that nature, impacts. But I bring this up just because um, oftentimes we'll recommend increasing densities, but we haven't done so here. And that's maybe something we can talk about, at least in your town center area. Because if you offer greater density, you can get in exchange for that sometimes, you know, greater amounts of open space, et cetera, and, you know, sometimes greater affordability. If that's, if that's an issue for the town. 
I'll tell you in Lake Worth, it's a huge issue. Uh, Bridge Road. We looked at Bridge Road. We did the existing conditions drawing. Bridge Road has great, great opportunity. Um, you've got some great businesses on there right now. Again, I can't believe, you know, the occupancies that you have with local businesses in town. But you've got this weird, like, double deep asphalt parking condition in front of this, some of the buildings. It bleeds out quite a bit. There's no containment there. So what we're suggesting is that over time, either through redevelopment or just streetscape projects, that you formalize on-street parking on both sides. You maybe allow for the creation of, you know, these are sort of usable open spaces. But really, and also creating a bioswale type of median here to contain water. Um, more and more often, you know, water retention um, and stormwater um, collection is, is becoming more and more of an issue in every, in every time. Um, we're working in Lantana right now, too, and I had no idea the severity of their, their, um, their um, drainage, but flooding issues, you know, their king, king tide issues. Is this Bridge Road? Yes, this is Bridge Road looking from Old Dixie East. So like sea luster is on the right hand side, you know, those businesses. And that big building behind that, that was, that's a new one that we took the liberty of putting in there. But what happens though is that this now, over time, this doesn't become the back of Paradise Park in your town center, it becomes a front. So you can actually create a residential street on Bridge Road or a mixed use street, um, which would be really, really wonderful place to be. And you know the north side of it is is actually pretty well set up um, because there's sidewalks, etc. But um, this is something that you could get into greater detail and do an actual streetscape project for. This would be a capital improvement project. The fashion mall, um, we are going to develop this a little bit further bef before the final. I want to I want to revise these drawings. Again, this was one of those interesting conditions where. Um, the tenants, for the most part, are great. I mean, people like going there. There are reasons to go there. It's an odd configuration for a shopping center. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting, that little courtyard thing on the inside. Um, but of all of the sites that we talked to folks about that might be a priority for really visualizing redevelopment, this was one of them. And so each of these drawings on the left has, has um, east, up, meaning you're, there's US-1 going across the top. And the idea is to, is to create, again, some sort of, and we sound like a broken record, but some sort of central open space there, some sort of gathering spot where um, it could be square, it could be linear, where you could have outdoor seating, etc. The parking now is no longer the most prominent feature facing US-1. It's easily accessible behind the buildings. And whether it's a whole series of multiple buildings like this, or perhaps more realistically, when we redo this, um, it's, a, it's just two or three buildings that might replace what's there. Again, this is incentivizing redevelopment over time. Um, the mixed use zoning would allow multiple stories and residential, um, you know, so more than what's allowed there today. Um, there's an example that um, exists in Palm Beach Gardens. I don't know if you all know this. There's a place called PGA Commons, and um, on paper, I never thought it would work. You know, when I heard this project was coming in, I'm like, I don't, I just don't ever see anybody sitting out on PGA Boulevard having dinner, you know, especially at a nice restaurant. The way they detailed it, though, was beautiful. They did a great job. There's enough separation between the highway, because PGA, this is west of 95, it's fast. PGA is fast anyway, but... You know, it's a big six or eight laner out there. Uh, not entirely unlike what you have on US-1. Um, but they set the buildings back far enough uh, that they were to create some separation with some street trees and things and provide tons of outdoor seating, little interior courtyards and things. And it's really, in my opinion, one of the most successful, you know, recent within 15 or 20 years of development on PGA Boulevard in the gardens. It's really been very successful. In fact, they've stolen a couple of our restaurants from West Palm. Um, but if you haven't been there, it's worth going to experience. It's, it's almost identical to what we sketched for 
for, um, for the fashion. Now this is another idea that we cooked up on our own. Um, so it's probably kind of kooky. No, 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 not this one. The next one kind of is kooky. <laughs> this one's a little kooky too. Um, you've got these enormous parking lot there in front of Marshalls and Bells and um, what is it? Home Goods, thank you. And it really diminishes, um, and this is Dana speaking, it diminishes, all of that asphalt diminishes some of the positive uh, impacts from your complete street project. Um, our recommendation is, that, and, and it's, it's, it's interesting the way the shopping center works, is that you've got the big boxes down here. This is Truist. This is the old, um, what was the bank? BB&T. <laughs> that they knocked down and rebuilt, right? Yeah. Um, and then you've got the big boxes here, but the center continues up and then comes closer to the street up there, very similar to the shops to the south. Um, our recommendation is that um, you consider doing small liner buildings that are closer up to the street that take one or two of the, of the, of the parking bays. Um, this is a long shot, I know, um, because you know retailers have absolute control over their parking areas, and you know even though the the parking is obviously only half full and maybe is never full, um, there's that built-in concern of concealing, you know, shops. Normally we wouldn't recommend this, except these are such strong destinations within town; everybody knows they're there. Um, so even if it's not buildings like interior buildings, um, um, storefronts. Um, there are ways to do pavilions or some sort of screening that would provide some buffering for the, for the sidewalks and the bike lanes from all of that asphalt. It just kind of falls apart right there. There's a couple of good examples in, in, in um, Jupiter, actually, a military trail, where publics came, well, Rick Gonzalez, who did your rec center, he did a Publix up there where they have a they have a, a pergola or a pavilion type of structure along military trail, which just helps to to create some separation between those huge parking fields, which we know unfortunately for the most part are necessary. Now, um, what we did recommend here though as well, these are longer term concepts. You see, some of these things we could start working on tomorrow, like the roundabout. Um, some of these things like this, working with NILSA, we can come up with street sections to start to identify what is the preferred frontage for, and I'll talk about frontage in a few moments. Frontage is important. Um, along US-1 is part of the code. Um, but then there's this opportunity that we saw where you've got sidewalks on the first block from US-1 heading east, and then it gradually drops off. And then you don't even know that the water's back there. Now granted, the condo blocks the view at some point, but there's no continuous pedestrian connectivity. Although there is some ample space back there. Um, so perhaps over time, um, if there's redevelopment of different pieces or if there's the ability to acquire um, a bay of parking or at least to get access to some of the private property to create a linear um, pathway along the north side of Tequesta Drive. Again, this is Tequesta Drive. This is the terminus of your, you know, your whole community main street and it just kind of dies into the side of a condo. So as I said, this is a longer term thing to ever get, you know, a waterfront pavilion out there on the, on the lagoon might be, a, might be a stretch, but at least to provide a softened edge along the north side and provide safe passage for the pedestrians that are out there walking dogs and things. Um, also potentially walking to, you know, um, the restaurants that you have on the corridor. So I didn't put in the existing conditions. I didn't want to um, take up too much time, but we came up with a couple of scenarios for completing, if you will, or continuing to complete the US-1 highway, um, you know, repurposing. We know that there's been lots of mixed feelings about the going from a six to four conversion on US-1. Um, it is what it is at this point. What we did hear, even from folks that support that condition, which I will admit I'm, I'm one of them, although I'm not a resident, um, is that it was never finished. There's just not enough of the landscaping and the softening of the corridor to, to take it to the next level. So what we considered 
um, are ways to, oh, I put in the same slide twice, I apologize. Um, ways to working with property owners or through redevelopment of, of either side, um, either acquiring access to get landscaping on private property, or in this case, what we're suggesting, because this is something that came up, is that maybe the curbs actually, if I'm not mistaken, and some of you might know better, um, the original proposal was for the was for the curbs to come all the way out to the edge, and then this to be a multi-purpose path, 10 or 12 foot multi-purpose path, not a, a continuous bike lane within the travel lanes or adjacent to the travel lanes. Anyway, um, what we illustrated here was um, ultimately maybe moving the curbs out so that you've got landscape um, area here between the vehicles and the multi-purpose path, and then you've got space for shade trees on either side. Either way, um, I apologize I didn't put in the, 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 the other image, but um, we work with a, we're working in Stewart right now on their US-1 corridor, trying to identify, you know, is there a place where we can plant a tree? You know, because most of these rights of way are just maxed out. You know, you've got back of sidewalk to back of sidewalk, there's nothing but asphalt and, and concrete and broken glass. You know, and there's like very few places to plant a tree within the public right of way. So what we're doing is working with actually literally going parcel to parcel, owner to owner, talking to them about, you know, a program that we're working on with the city of Stewart, where, whereby every so often a parking space, say maybe a saw cut out, you know, a tree is planted there, it's paid, that work is paid for by the city, maintenance is paid for by the city, et cetera. And then you start to get shade, even if it's on private property, it still grows over the sidewalk. Um, because when you've got limited right of way, it's very, very difficult to, to figure out a way to do that. So this is, uh, we would recommend um, whatever form it takes, whether, as I said, it's through redevelopment, whether it's through an aggressive approach, which is moving the, with moving the curves, which is an expensive proposition, or working with property owners just to get some shade trees um, with some degree of consistency on the corridor would make a huge difference. Now, we, and Nilsa, this is where um, I, I want to spend some time with you um, in the near future. Um, we talked about the open space provisions. This is a diagram, it needs to be annotated, but it shows the different ways that public open space can be provided. Maybe it's a corner plaza here. Maybe it's a corner green. Maybe it's a linear park in front. You see that what these diagrams represent are you know, city blocks, if you will, and then this is the public open space, or this is the public open space. Or maybe you even create like a boulevard type of section here. This is what we call a detached green. This is what we call an attached green, where it's still part of the block. Or even something more um, sizable, um, depending upon, you know, the type of development or the, the, the level of commitment from the town, uh, excuse me, the village. Um, so these things uh, could be, and we have in the past, incorporated these type of diagrams into um, land development regulation updates so that it's clear when we talk about 30, 40 percent open space, whatever it is, especially if you're like within the town center area, um, that it needs to be delivered in one of these forms. And if it's not, you need to explain why. We had a great conversation about drive-throughs, if you'll recall. Yep. Drive-throughs um, drive are a problem. Um, but the question is, are, is it just that drive-throughs in and of themselves are evil? <laughs> or is it that they just haven't been designed very creatively? I mentioned to the mayor um, I mean, I'm not a fan of drive throughs I find myself in them more than I care to admit. But um, part of the problem with drive throughs is that typically, um, you know, they, they require large curb cuts, and oftentimes they're in front or the side of buildings. And so they tend to break down the continuity of, like, a streetscape. And 
So what we've seen in some places, again, I'm mentioning Rick Gonzalez, he did a project at Bank in West Palm, the lower right-hand corner where the drive through you actually go through the building, which is really a beautiful way to do that, right? Um, or, as I mentioned to the mayor, I pointed out to um, this um, Starbucks, of all things, in Lake Worth Beach, that's on US-1, where the building is entirely fronting the street. It's set back enough, this is just a little Starbucks, set back enough where there's outdoor seating. They did a great job, this is recent too. Um, and the drive-through is entirely behind the building. You have to circulate around the block and then come through. So it does not interrupt that street frontage at all. Um, we talked about drive-throughs during the charrette, I think, for a couple of reasons. One is that they're, they're a street killer, you know, if they're not designed properly. But two, drive-throughs are often attached to national chains. And there was a lot of discussion during the charrette about we don't want any more national chains. How do we, you know, that dreaded coffee shop that I mentioned, or those dreaded arches, or whatever else, because it tends to just, I hate to say it, we all go to them, but it does tend to junk up the environment a little bit. That's not to say that there aren't amazing McDonald's in urban conditions in different places, but it's a hard sell to get that out on US-1. So the, the point of discussing drive-throughs in the report is twofold. One is that you can, you can require that they're done in such a way that if I'm just your average fast food place, I'm not gonna be bothered. So I may just go down the street. And that can be good or that can be bad. You know, there's a tax-based discussion there. You know, there's a lot of facets to that. Um, however, if I really, if I'm a fast food joint and I really wanna be here, maybe I'm willing to spend the extra money to do something special. Even be part of a, God forbid, a mixed-use building on US-1. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen a national chain in South Florida be part of a mixed-use building. I've seen them in other cities, of course. Um, but anyway, uh, those are connected but sort of separate discussions. We didn't get into the use discussion in this draft report here. Um, and I wanted to have that conversation with, with you all this evening to see if that's something that you feel we should, we should push. Um, I know that different cities do it different ways. I know that um, the city of Stewart, just for their just for their downtown, just the footprints of their main street, has I forget what it's called, but they call them franchise. I don't forget what they call them, franchise businesses or whatever are prohibited. But that's not US one. That is their main street. <clears throat> so I think um, I know that the town of Palm Beach has certain requirements that we've heard about. Um, so whether or not we misunderstood or we need to push the envelope further, um, I won't belabor this anymore, but I would like to hear from you all this evening. As I mentioned before, you know, um, the idea of stormwater infrastructure and green infrastructure and, you know, um, my, my colleague, Jessica, who was on the shred, even found some information on bird-friendly glazing, which I'd never heard of. Apparently, birds don't crash into the glass. That's a good thing. You don't want dead birds out in front of your house. Um, but there are technologies these days, and it doesn't mean you have to become lead, you know, lead, platinum, or something like that. But there are technologies. There, there are, there are stormwater and, and pervious surface technologies out there today that are amazing. Where you could actually turn Bridge Road, as an example, into a stormwater facility, yet still have it be passable as a street, beautiful, and have on-street parking. You know, so we wanted to at least touch on some of that, and Ilsa, I know, is, is very familiar with, with some of these practices. But this is something that was brought up quite a bit um, during the, the charrette process as well as dark sky night lighting. And I have to say, I'm not that familiar with this, but my colleagues at work are. And there are different types of fixtures and light bulbs and wattages, etc. cetera. Um, obviously, I'm not an expert, but really um, dilute um, 
light pollution at night. Um, something to consider. It was brought up emphatically a few times, so we decided to put a little bit of information about that within the report. Now, we still have work to do. I don't know if you noticed this, um, but there was an Appendix A and an Appendix B where we still have some information forthcoming. <clears throat> Just to tell you what those are, um, the creation of the master plan appendix A is really just a catalog of photographs of the charrette process and the presentations and the and the and the and the um, citizen plans and all of that. Um, it's not. I mean, it's in, it's essential information, but we wanted to spend our focus of time to this point on the projects and what's coming next, and then also just some background and existing condition stuff that will be part of the report as well. So those are still under construction. I wanted to point out. But we did spend a lot of time on Appendix C and Appendix D. Appendix C has to do with building frontages. We identified, I think, a half dozen different building frontage types. What does that mean? Buildings have fronts and they have backs, just like people. How the front of a building is designed has everything to do with how it functions. If it's a retail shop, if it's an arcade, if it's a residential unit, if it's a mixed use or office building, you know, the way that parts and pieces are assembled have everything to do with whether those buildings function properly for their, their intended purpose. For instance, some folks, exhibitionists maybe, wouldn't mind living in a storefront, but that's not typically a residential type of building front. Do you know what I mean? Arcades are very interesting. I personally love arcades. You know, when you walk through arcades, um, but they don't work well with residential buildings because you're too close to the residential units. They're forcing you inside what is almost private space. So there are some delicacies to, and also what tends to happen a lot of times with arcades in particular is if they're not designed properly, they're not even wide enough for two people to walk abreast. And that becomes a real problem. So what we've done is we've developed these different frontage types with some critical dimensions. So that this is something, these are tools that you could use. Um, like say we've got buildings coming in on US-1 and we want to have that PGA Commons type of effect. You know, what does it mean to have a storefront, a traditional storefront? What does it mean to have an arcade? What does it mean to have a stoop for a townhouse? You know, you don't want to have stoops when you have retail. They don't really work. So it's kind of, I hate to say it, it's kind of like you know a kit of parts or you know Mr. Potato Head, but you know Mr. Potato Head can look good or he can look like weird and and not work very well. So we've included a number of pages of different frontage types, and those can be aligned in the code, like what districts, where in the mixed use, because your mixed use district is huge. It's like three or four different streets, you know. Um, a lot of it's built out. Um, where are the locations where these fronted types are appropriate? I would tell you that the arcade frontage type probably is not appropriate on Bridge Road. It's probably too intense. That could be wrong. The retail frontage type or a townhouse frontage type where you have stoops, you know, and townhouses would be perfect for Bridge Road. An arcade type along Main Street or Tequesta Drive in your town center might be perfectly fine as well. So it really depends on the location. And again, we can, we can start to define that a little bit further with, with your team. And then finally, we heard a lot about architectural styles. Um, and are we doing a pattern book or not? We mentioned pattern book inside of our, our scope of services that we would you know, talk about a pattern book. But we, we decided to put together the guts of one just to see if we were going in the right direction. There's a handful of styles a few that we heard about, West Indies, I, I, I've heard people love this style and are sick of it at the same time uh, in Tequesta. Um, but I want to quickly run through what we've assembled in this, this Appendix D relative to design guidelines. Again, there are DNA components that make up certain architectural styles. Um, rarely, are you ever going to find a round window in a wooden bungalow? Unless maybe it's in Nantucket. But you will often find round windows in Art Deco architecture. You know, 
there are different components that are part of the DNA of different architectural styles. So what we try to do is go through here, and I'm going to go in detail just through West Indies, but then just talk briefly about the other ones. We define what are the elements that define a style? What are the roof components? What are the finishes and features? What are the doors and windows? Are there stoops and porches? What about overhangs? You know, an overhang in an Art Deco building is very different than an overhang for a bungalow or a West End. And then the foundation. Uh, this gets into a little bit more detail. And when you talk about those, what are examples of those? You know, what are doors and windows that are appropriate for, you know, West Indies type of architecture? Now, maybe this is getting too detailed. I don't know. Um, but we did want to provide you with some initial thoughts on if design guidelines were desirable for your town, for the village. Um, you know, this is an approach that, that we've taken in other places. Um, roof surfaces, you'll notice the parapet, the undulating sort of decorative parapet is very um, consistent with West Indies architecture, as are the exposed brackets, the, you know, the, the beautiful um, concrete tile roofs, which, which are expensive and people don't like to build those anymore. But, um, and then just a gallery of different examples. And you have a lot of this here already. Then we, we also went through to the same level of detail four other different styles. Mediterranean Revival, this is Worth Avenue. Uh, Mid-century modern, maybe not the best example for the questas I'm looking at a little more closely. <laughs> it's like it's gonna take off. <laughs> Look at your original um, uh, village hall. I mean, you have a history of mid-century architecture here, which is very interesting. You know, you may or may not like it. You may or may not want to push it, but um, Art Deco. Art Deco is a, is a good medium scale, you know, beachside type of, of architecture. And then, frankly, you've got a very strong um, ranch style residential fabric. And listen, it took me a long time to appreciate the ranch style, but um, there are elements to it that are, that are actually quite elegant. You know, they are very long and low slung. You know, they often have a split level. You know, they often have cupolas and fireplaces. There, there, there was thought that went into those. Um, so anyway, we've detailed out in the appendix to the same level as West Indies, each of these different styles. Now, we may have missed the mark. Uh, you may say, we hate mid-century Martin, or we wish it would all go away. Um, it occurs to me in talking with Lance, Nilsa, your, 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 your planner here, um, and maybe it's too late, I don't know. But we were talking about the beach and sea glass. And what are some of the other potential larger beachfront buildings that might come in? What is an appropriate style for that? Um, that's a tough one. Because if you go out and look what's out there today, Stuff that was built in the 60s and 70s, not so good. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I mean, especially economically, if I'm spending eight, ten, twelve million dollars on a condo on the beach, I, I would like to have glass. However, even that can be done. A more modern um, beach side, medium sized tower can be done elegantly. Um, you know, there's a couple of examples that come to mind that are very nautical in their nature. They almost look like they're elements of a cruise ship, you know what I mean? And there, there's, a, there's a reason, there's a rhythm to what's there, their design. So anyway, um, I don't know if that's something that, that you would like us to pursue as well. But um, anyhow, I've spoken, en I've talked enough. Um, <coughs> like I said, I'm hoping to get some input from you this evening, um, there are things that I know that we need to finish and finesse a little bit more and review um, ultimately the final report. I do want to also sit with you and your team and talk about what are some code elements that we can put in here that you can take and you know implement hopefully or, or at least beneficial to you that are useful. Um, <clears throat>
And if there are enough changes or revisions, uh, we're happy to come back and present this as often as you like. You know, in a more larger public forum for the final report. Um, it's not that I like to hear myself talk, but you know, there's, um, <clears throat> you know, we, we, we work for you and we're happy, to, we, we wanna make sure that this effort is beneficial and useful to you all so that, um, so that you feel good about actually having gone through the event. So with that, um, thank you for your time. Thank you, Dan, that was a great presentation. I'll open the floor to council comments. Oh, I came in with notes. But <laughs> I'll start with a couple things. There. Thank you uh, for starting that. Uh, are you guys going to put together kind of like from your professional opinion what you think our partner <clears throat> should be with some of the areas that you identified? What may be some of the first recommended areas that have the biggest impact for our area? <clears throat> Absolutely, we can do that. Not every town or village wants that. Interestingly enough, so I'm glad you brought that up. Um, having a schedule, almost a schedule of implementation, things to start with. Um, I mean, if I was in your shoes, I would try to start the roundabout discussion tomorrow. <coughs> yeah, that's a health safety issue. Some of these are, are um, you know, interesting ideas, you know, and may not have the same, carry the same weight. Obviously, um, I think getting some pieces of the frontage standards, the open open space standards, um, into code revisions are important. I think that maybe upgrading the design standards. Jeremy and I were talking about this um, a little bit earlier. It, it might make a lot more sense to focus on the commercial larger scale buildings than, because some of these are residential. You know, and the idea is, is not to force people in the neighborhoods to do certain architectural styles. You don't have historic districts. I don't think there's a desire for that. I don't know that it's important. Uh, but maybe focus a little bit more on larger scale buildings that, that impact the, the beach, the R1, R2. Um, but yes, a prioritized list of recommendations, absolutely. Yeah. I <clears throat> I have over the next six and say, here's what we really should be talking about today. And otherwise, I can go through every slide and tell you what I like and don't like about all the renderings. But you know, if some of these things are 10 years out or possibly never going to happen, I feel like uh, you know, that would be a bit of a waste of time. But what are we really looking at tonight and saying, hey, what are the next steps to green light this? And what are your, what are your thoughts on this? You know what I mean? It's just, it would be too much for me right now, even though I'm not sure where to start. What we can do is we can put together a prioritized list with an estimated time frame and who your partner agencies would be. Obviously, um, if, and I'm picking on the little roundabout thing, but that's, that's DOT, that's um, probably the TPA, and possibly Palm Beach County. You know, that you would need to coordinate with. Um, any of the linear park stuff, whether you wanted to do it or not, that's obviously FEC has got to be part of that conversation. So we can start to map that out for you. Um, and then I think that I think that might help frame things a little bit better to feel comfortable about you know things being doable. Perspective: The main things that we can, that I was looking to try to accomplish with Wayne were on the code side. And how do you think we can definitely help you choose to protect what you got um, and the direction going forward? That for us is, I won't say low hanging fruit, but that to me is where I think the priority should be is the code side. Thank you. I have focused a lot on the open space component of the code. I touched briefly on building height and density and that there wasn't, at least during the shred, an appetite to increase either one of those. Um, when you say focus on the code, what Which other areas do you touch? Like, so like if thinking of like Bridge Road, 
right? How do we get kind of an idea of what you want that to look like? How do we reinforce that? sure that if somebody comes in there wants to redo all that, we're going to have maybe some revisions front of the street over those people. So I think you're saying, I think maybe what would be helpful is, and correct me if I'm wrong, but like case studies of like private public partnership where these right. things can be implemented because I don't know that Tequesa has had that much success with that in the past. So if there's any good examples of municipalities where this was a vision, they worked with the developer, this is how it happened. That might help guide us because I, like I said, I still don't have a, a good history of that. Yeah, that's true. A lot of the stuff we're talking about is private property. Mm -hmm. Most of it is. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, but with that, you know, we still have that experience of working pretty well with our developers. They come in and show us. So that's, that's, I mean, that's one part, right? But the other part is um, those are developers who have purchased something and plan to redevelop it, right? And we're talking about someone in existing and going, hey, do you mind if we knock your building down and build it? <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> that's not and that's a stream, but yeah. you know I mean? We're talking about coming in and saying, hey, like you said, uh, there has been success with private um, property giving us a little land space because for whatever reason, it's going to push back a little bit off the US one, it's going to make things nicer, whatever the situation is, but little things like that, I think, uh, so I would really want to know any thoughts on that. I know you do. I, I think there are things, kind of the house can do. I think there's things that we can initiate or we can guide through the process. And you mentioned the brown dog thing. And, and I think streets and developments, uh, what we'd like to do with things either with other agencies or we can control ourselves. Those, to me, would be high priorities. I agree with you. The second thing, I think, is looking at what code revisions we want to make. So if we do provide uh, more definitive guidelines for developers, because you're right, a lot of the stuff is going to be dependent on private developers who may, you know, who knows if Fashion Mall is, I mean, you hear talk about Fashion Mall being a prime redevelopment property, but you're right, five, 10, 15, yep. 20 years away. So I think defining what the code elements are that we like to see, so that we have those in place so that when people do come to us, we can sit down and say, okay, we're still going to look at the process we have now, which is you come to us early, you come to us with the concept and design, but then Nils is able, able to give them the proper guidance as to what we're expecting. And then when we get it, you know, we can provide the feedback that's necessary. And if it's something that requires a true partnership where we're working hand in hand with them, that's great. If it's something that they're, they're undertaking it, but we're giving them the guidance and telling them, here's what you need to do, here's what we expect, then, then I think that's, you know, then that'll be You know, you're right. A number of the things you put forth are, you know, kind of ideas, hypotheticals, whatever, and, and who knows, you know, what, in terms of any particular plot, what it might end up looking like. But I know what the goal is to, again, try to set standards and set a direction to say, here's what we'd like to see here. And we want to make it work so that it's profitable for you, but benefits the, you know, the residents of the village at the same time. Where I really need to work with you, Nelson, is understanding the delta between what is required today and what the expectations are in the future. I well, think it's key to listen to the council because mm -hmm. uh, what is the vision for Bridge Road? What is the vision for, for example, the fashion? You know, then we can do both. Is you know, both. But uh, the vision part. That gets into the design elements, and you know, I, I look at, for example, the new rec center as kind of a kind of a got a West Indies feel to it, not exactly like some of the examples you showed us. Personally, I really like the direction that you know that we, we took with the rec center and the ultimate design that we had. Um, so personally, I, I'm gonna I, I like a West Indies, uh, you know, I'll call it, we'll call it a coastal ocean type. But right now, the village is kind of a mishmash. We've got some Mediterranean. We've got some stuff I don't even know if it's definable. Um, <laughs> so I think, you know, again, and, and again, you're going to get different opinions. You're, you're not going to get unanimity on this throughout the community. We're all, all moving. So 
but it, it becomes some uh, some you know decision as to what we'd like generally to see, and then we can put that forth, and then you know, something else can work with with you. So tell me if 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 what I'm about to say um, <clears throat> seems to be in line with, with your thoughts. Um, one of the other things that we are planning on doing relative to the code, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, is identifying the different conditions, um, say within your mixed use areas. There's the Dixie Highway condition, there's the, there's the Bridge Road condition, there's the Tequesta Drive condition, there's the US Wine Commission. Each one of those conditions are different. And so mapping those different conditions and then identifying through street sections where you identify what the sidewalk dimensions are, the relative distance of the building set back to the edge of the sidewalk, you know, actually taking it to that level where it's starting to represent what would be, you know, code information, um, parking locations, things of that nature. Um, my only hesitancy in this is that usually we're working with cities that, um, or towns or villages, um, where there's an opportunity to incent stuff. Like right now, I got to provide 30%, but you know, I can, today I can do it in parking aisles, and now you're telling me I got to make a park. You know, what is the incentive for me to do that? Am I getting any more density? I'm not getting any more height. You know, if I, and this, this quickly becomes a legal question. Um, you know, if we start to modify setbacks, lot coverage, things of that nature, at what point are we starting to take something away that they currently have? Right. And that's just, that's a delicate situation that, you know. It is, and we've talked about this, it's diminished their private property rights. So, yeah, that's, granted, you gotta, you gotta look at that, but, um, I guess the question is how much can we accomplish before we sort of get to that point? So I think what you just said is exactly what I'm, what I'm looking okay. at. Excellent. And that's what I'm trying to, to balance that. Thank well, you. it started with the vision stuff. Right. And it's going to end up with the stuff hopefully that will implement the vision stuff. Um, keep in mind, yeah, I, you know, if I'm, if, if I'm Oceana and I'm at the fashion mall and I'm doing well, I don't want the building. Um, but, you know, God forbid something happens, things happen to buildings, you know, you've got to have a game plan in place for if something happens, or if a new owner comes in and says, wow, I can do three or four stories here, and I got one story now. You know, one thing that we can start to look at that I think might be um, an incentive or off-site parking locations, because if, I, if, I'm, if I'm fully built out now at Fashion Mall, and I've got all my spaces surface parked, and now I want to do a four-story building in place. I, don't, I probably don't have enough parking spaces. So what do I do there? That's another you know constraint. So one of the things that that a, a village can offer are some offsite parking opportunities. You know what I mean? Shared parking opportunities, and, and we can look into that a little bit as well. Whereas you don't have, or even parking reductions. You don't even have to provide. One of the things we talk about in the report that's nice about. The fashion mall is that it's only like 350 feet, as I recall, north of Tequesta Drive. It's essentially part of your main street. If it's detailed properly from, from the corridor up to that point. Do we, do we have to define that in the code, or is that something that would be negotiable? The parking stuff? Well, I mean, we can, def I mean, we, we can always offer variance. So I guess the question is, um, to what extent does that have to be specified you know, down to the nitty-gritty detail or to what extent do we, do we have some room to allow for variances in exchange for sure. different a value trade-offs? So it needs to be detailed only to the extent that you're comfortable detailing. I mean, that's something that could be left to, you know, um, ultimate decision by the, the planning administrator, the town manager, you guys. You know, you can decide who makes that decision if you want to waive certain parking requirements. <laughs> And you know what? I mean, this happens a lot. Um, not a lot, but I mean, depending upon your location, mm -hmm. you know, certain areas are, are make much more reasonable park once environments, as we call them, where I park my car here, and now I'm going to go to Oceana, I'm going to go to the gym, I'm going to do a handful of things and leave my car one spot. 
So I'm not requiring a parking spot at all these different places. And that gives you the opportunity to take some of the pressure <coughs> off of having, you know, six, eight spaces per thousand for a restaurant, you know, at one of these locations. Um, I mean, we can look into strategy to that. It doesn't actually have to be the code per se. And I think we understand that we want to help support our businesses, but I think also from our mindset too, that is everyone has that parking spot at their home. Meaning we see that our village as really representing our residents and utilizing those businesses. And so there's, that usually has to, that's the priority in my mind, is that that is a comfortable use of space. Residents coming first and then using that space. Let me ask you, I should know this. Um, do you have, this is gonna sound like an odd question, but do, do a lot of your residents use golf carts? <laughs> no, you're not supposed to. You just did it. You opened it up. Okay. We're going to have to another workshop for that. <laughs> We're getting more and more. You can't, have, you can't have a conversation. I mean, you know. I'll tell you, I'll just tell you something. I, when I was at the city of Delray Beach, they were panicked because these golf carts were happening all over the place. People were opening up businesses, and it was like crazy. And they're street legal, 35 miles an hour, 35 mile, miles an hour or less. One of our issues is people want to use them not street legal. I get it. People always figure out a way to break the rules. But I will tell you one thing that's interesting about them that it hadn't dawned on me until we were working on it is that that's really a locals only thing. I'm not coming to, to Cuesta from West Palm Beach or even from Jupiter for that matter in a golf cart. It's really a resident thing. And guess what? Golf carts are a lot small, smaller than cars. And so you can actually park them in greater concentrations. And it's almost like creating reserved parking for residents. Because by, by default, nobody from outside is going to be bearing a golf cart. I know there's lots of other issues, I'm sure. But it's just, what's that? It's electric vehicle as well. It's electric vehicle. Some, well, not all. I just said never, that had never crossed my mind until um, we started seeing that as a, as almost an incentive or a benefit, a, a resident benefit. You know, that I've got reserved spaces somewhere because nobody else is gonna bring the golf cart here from out of town. And in a place like Delray Beach, where people are coming from all over the place, go to Atlantic Avenue for restaurants and stuff, having a few little golf cart spaces here and there goes a long way. But I'll leave it alone, <laughs> Mr. Allen, sorry about that. Actually, um, it's actually not a bad idea. I mean, again, the issue has been people wanting to use them, but not upgrading to street legal status. If they're upgrading to street legal status, that's a whole different story. It becomes a huge enforcement issue, too, because then you get kids exactly. on Exactly. So I'd like to kind of get back to the draft plan, if we can. Lori, do you have any com I have some specific comments on the draft presentation to help you guys finish. If other people like my comments, but I think you had some pretty yes, detailed comments, if you want to go first. Yes. Um, so first, thank you for saying that you feel like your designers have lose your mind. Um, I definitely see that in some of those slides. Um, I do like that you guys are trying to keep a lot of our connectivity, which is important because we want a lot of access points for residents to be able to come and go easily and not get jammed up on few entrances and exits, especially trying to avoid the new roads like you just want to be able to maneuver easily is, thank you for that. I do like the tree, like adding trees and purpose to any of our roads. Um, and particularly when you had the bridge roads light up, just beautifying those roads and giving them some visual purpose. So when our residents who actually live here are driving around the local roads like those roads and going to Publix Road, the old Dixie, giving them some purpose I think is a plus for our residents because we're the ones that drive around daily. The slide that has Old Dixie and Sequesta Drive and it had that ginormous monument destination thing that you called it. Yeah, I'm going to flat out say they can leave that. And that's just my opinion. Because um, I just don't know what that purpose is. It didn't make, doesn't make sense completely. Um, it's more of an entrance focal point, so I could see something else there, but maybe not a thing that people are going to. So is going to Village Boulevard and Old Dixie 
um, if we did a roundabout there, you know, having a focal point there. So I could see something near our sign with the great landscaping that Doug Zoe's doing pretty much seasonally, rather than an actual building or monument location. Again, for us, I, I don't, don't know if we're there yet. My own personal opinion, please don't bring up Bright Line Station again. <laughs> um, it's not for the train use, it's just our space and the safety of others coming in who aren't leaving anything into Quasta. They're not necessarily shopping here, they're just they would just be coming to park at the station and jump to Orlando or whichever. Can I ask you something quick? Me? Yeah. yeah. I think the, I agree with you, I'm not a big fan of the bright line at this moment, but I think the idea of the shred is more for the next 50 years. But in 50 years, oh, that sure. might make a lot of sense. Yes. Yeah, to have a I train mean, the station. spacing, I'm just saying for right now, again, that's my opinion. And I, I think the idea of the shred is more. Yeah, okay, so, and I didn't know how, I didn't know we were gonna see him and his team next, so I kind of just wanted, I came in prepared to give him a lot of the feedback I saw from what we were given. Because I didn't know you were going oh, this back, is, and this is great. No, plus, this we, is great. I never get to sit with you guys, and right. it's not like I can go to your office and chit chat. Um, density, yeah, I think we should just stay at what we have and not increase. I think in the building layouts you had, whether we're doing in the front of the streets or in the back, I think if it were to increase, that would just mess with anything we were to do with code as far as what we expect the redevelopment to do, whether it was in the front of the street or in the back. I'm sorry. Increase density. Okay. I I would not be I would rather see it the way it is. I in the dream world like to see it go down, but that's not gonna happen. Vehicle access, that was that was my notes. Um, when you brought up the fashion plaza, again, if we as a council are looking for the future for buildings to either be placed by the roads or far, farther from the road, the parking lot in the front, you said, you said it, that that current configuration of that building right now is kind of funky. Um, it doesn't have any connectivity access points like that building is salt. So if it were to ever be redeveloped, and let's say it was placed towards the road, having it broken up so there's more entrances and exits for easier flow, and then that also eliminates build up of cars trying to come and go onto the main road. Oh, I know you, and it's funny, I knew you were going to bring it up too. The PGA Commons area, I'm personally not a huge fan of that design, only because I do have to go there to an office there as well as the pediatrician office, and it is a nightmare trying to turn into there because they have developed it so tight and then the way that they have the parking so on the inside you pull in and you go either left or right and the parking that is on the back side of the building is actually on the front of those businesses entrances and it gets really confusing you can't see their signage you can't see what's going on you got pe people put up to the sidewalk I'm not a personal fan of that design so I wouldn't want to see something like that with the parking going up right in front of their door. So an entrance behind, but then not so tight. Give it some space so there's ease. So I know we were talking about, real quickly, the relationship of plaza owners, even current day. It would be great if we could just, in a friendly conversation, whether it's Jeremy or Nielsa or Doug or whoever, just help educate, even though if you beautify your shopping center, if it, it does bring people to your businesses, people like to go there. So whether it's adding more landscaping to the inside of the parking lots, and I don't know if that's something you add to the code later. So rather than just like one palm tree that's in between eight parking spots, add, have them required to add some sort of better buffer. So there's not just more shade, but more beauty, and you feel more welcome to go into those parking lots. I'd like to see us add something like that to the code. Yeah, just and again, it just enhance, for them. It just enhances their entire shopping center. I think it's great that you brought up green stormwater roads. Anything we can do to help drainage, it's less pain on our system. Is the word I'm looking for. Um, I would be careful with incentives to developers. I do think we're doing a good job so far of working with 
developers that are coming in and we're having a conversation per project. I don't know if putting an incentive, blanket incentive across the board would be something I would be interested in because I think each project is very unique in the location in which zoning it would be. So the other big things, and these were long-term things, I thought you put a slide in there that had nothing to do with our presentation. And I asked Jeremy, like, is that one for another place? And it was the one with the white building with the Spanish revi colonial revival look. And I, and I say that because the other slide you had had West Indies, Spanish revival, but nowhere in that was Florida inspiration. There was no coastal, there was no Key West, there was no Jacksonville, there was no Florida inspiration except for everywhere else. So my only critique for style would be, can we add something that has some Florida look to it? Yeah, so we had French, Dutch, Portuguese, Spanish, <laughs> where, where is the Florida Key West? Like, for me, there's just everyone else but us. That's, that, that is a Florida example, just so you know. I know, but I'm saying... It's because we, we grabbed all... I mean, that's where we... Key West grabbed so I, all the... Key West has 17 I'm not saying it has to be Key West. I'm just saying style. I'd like to see okay. more us, and it could be mixture, but I just... Sure. Immediately well, that's why I brought it up. What, what, what do you say is more about us? Because the West Indies... Okay, so that in particular, that design on the top in particular cool. is a Spanish look. Right. So I see that when I went to Barcelona. You go to right. Santa Fe, New Mexico, that's what you see. Right. But then when you go to the next slide, it says West Indies. So and the natural that, elements are great. And again, these are things we could go through with Neil. So if we wanted to do not nitty-bitty options, but giving people what we're looking for, whether it's natural elements, if we use wood, or canopies, or the types of railings they can choose from, just those things, those are familiar enough, but just that in particular, which is just, mm -hmm. okay. And then the other thing I wanted to bring up was, when you talked about Gallery Square Shopping Center mm -hmm. on Sequesta Drive, for me, that is inside the heart of our village. That's not US one, it's not people passing through morning and night and looking forward to Starbucks and whatever. Those are people who are coming into our village. They are trying to be a part of our community. So I like to see it more inclusive and welcoming, and I even wrote social, entertainment, there's festivals. I like, instead of having for that area that's inside the village, not necessarily ask for the buildings on the road, because then everything that's happening, whether they have music outside, or an activity, or they have a busy night at the restaurant, you're never gonna see that. And I know people are more inclined to walk and bike on village, or to West the Drive, you're not hiking on US1, pulling in trees. I just, I could see to Cuesta Drive being more inclusive and welcoming if we either did the building sideways, like I think you mentioned, or keeping them in the back and then having them park them up in the front. Because then it's just, it's inviting. It, it loses that country club feel. It's in the back for me that feels like you only go if you know about it. It's not. Yeah, but what you do, it's not set right up against a sidewalk. It's back enough so that you have room for tables and, and chairs and, and stuff like that. And that's bustling. You see five tables in front of Casa Cana and they're all packed. Yeah. You, know, you know it's you know it's busy, but you well, see that from the street is what I'm saying. But that's what, I, that's what I would perceive for something inside the village, just like you're saying. So just, just so curious, when you're driving by and you see all of you buck for mm -hmm. that's on the street. That's, in, that's, mm -hmm. that's inviting, that's, oh, hey, look, yeah. let's go there. Yeah. I think that's the idea. Is. Well, yeah, that's what I thought. I, it's, I, I was under the impression that we you're, were going to do the, the building C on the street. Yeah. Yeah, 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 so I actually side. have yeah. like yeah. a, that's a, a expanded vision of that area, and I was very vocal about this from the start, is I think, because I, I feel like that's the heart of Cosa, and we have this beautiful new rec center, and I think that area needs to be opened up to the rec center because that's where we have, you know, food truck nights, all of our holiday events. And if it's and if we open up the rec center area in Constitution Park to this whole center, then I think you'll get even more of a flow of people coming to the plazas, like walkability and just 
open up that whole area to the north of the rec center. If I, if I may, and I'm, this isn't trying to be defensive or anything, I just want to make sure that we understand. This is Seabrook. This is Sequester Drive. And if this were to ever redevelop, we're not recommending that it should. It's lovely the way it is, but things happen. That this corner become this public gathering space, this plaza, this green, whatever it might be. This is where that festival occurs. This is where that stuff happens, as opposed to the parking lot. Um, and that's really the point of showing this, is that you can already go a couple of stories, so that's sort of you know pressure for somebody who maybe want to redevelop in the future. But this is your community main and main intersection, right, if you will. That's why I said, you know, this thing that happens at, at, at FEC, that's the transition into you know, town where everybody else goes. But this is really, we felt, and, and you guys expressed it as, as council members and as residents, this is yours, you know? And so we felt that it would be ideal if over time there was a gathering space. How do you, so the rec center is just in that, the, in the, the top left the corner. Here. Yeah, so how, I mean, do you think you could come up with a different concept that opens that up to the rec center so you have a, a bigger area? Well, you've got a church right here. Right. You know. No, I'm saying, well, I mean, one way to do that is to make sure you've got street trees and your sidewalks are ample and that you've got street lighting. It's, it's not... I don't know. I don't know the distance, but I want to say it's it's got to be less than a thousand feet. I mean, it's an easy walk. And you have a crosswalk across it. Yeah. I think one of the challenges, like for example, there's been discussions the uh, convenience store. There's been discussions for years that that ever came on the market, and it was we could afford it. Mm. Trying to acquire that and meld it in. There was discussions with Lighthouse, the Lighthouse Center for the Arts, and and a commitment that was verbally made but never followed through on. Uh, where they have the school location, and make that available to the village as well, and then complete that whole corner virtually. So there are opportunities there if if they were if they were to arise. And we're in financial position to act on that. Or you have the rules in place that you know enable it or encourage it. You know, the one thing, on Old Dixie, um, you might want to check me on Old Dixie and, and see if that is actually a DOT issue. Because I, my understanding was Old Dixie is a county-owned road. And um, I know we had discussions with the county many, many years ago uh, about that road and about taking ownership of the road. Um, continued on certain things. So I don't know that that's a, a DOT issue. I think that may be a principally a county issue, just something to look into. Lori, do you have any comments? No, other than if we ever did do a roundabout, I absolutely would not recommend we do the two-lane version, where you have the two lanes doing the circle. So you have that in the central area, they have some tax info on time, but it's engineer-wise, I'm not looking at that yet. That's it. Okay, all right, I'll just go through my comments. I'm and just bear with me, because I'm gonna scroll through them on, I did electronically. Um, so I gave you my thoughts on opening up Gallery Square to the rec center. Um, I, I think we all seem in agreement that the roundabout is a high priority um, at Village Boulevard and Old Dixie. I'm sorry, would you say that again? Maybe the roundabout one? at Village and Old Dixie. But what about priority? That's a priority. Okay. I think we all agree on that. Um, and I think the Old Dixie Highway plan is a high priority too. So not just the roundabout, but the second plan you have for the... Um, I do agree with the linear park trailhead. I, I, it's a bit aggressive, but I mean, like you said, what, 20 years down the road, maybe it would fit. But I don't know if you maybe could come with up with an alternate softer solution there. And then, um, because we can look short, short term and long term, right? Because short term could be 10 years and then like say 20 years and something totally different. So I think it'd be good to have visions for both. And then um, the idea of having something there to help us all in that transition. Yeah. If I may add, Jeremy was just in Coral Gables over the weekend, and Coral Gables, if you've been there down south, they did a beautiful job of just having little garden walls and little trellises, and this kind of took on a life of its own, you know, during the charrette. 
absolutely will do a version that I think is more just more subtle, you know, um, ways of, you know, having just some beautiful markers and things that show the transition. And then um, a uh, former planning and zoning member and current EAC member had sent an email and um, wondering if anything can be looked at at Cypress Drive and to Quest a Drive. You guys looked at that because there's kind of commercial buildings on both sides there. So I added something for that intersection too. Kind of a unique one because it's so close to road tracks and Old Dixie. So you, you kind of have two separate intersections there. And then you have that big parcel. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I think I brought up just you know the things like Bridge Road, which is. Beautiful. I think that would be amazing for Bridge Road to look like that. So yeah, just how how do we get you know get what we can put in code into the code, and then how you know how we work with um, the private partners to make something like that happen. Um, kind of a general statement is I know hiding the parking is extremely popular. A lot of different municipalities have that plan where you have the building frontage up the street and the parking hidden. So I guess. What, if we go down that same path and want to adopt these visions, what makes us different from the rest of the municipalities that are doing the same thing? Like, what makes us unique and stand out a little bit more from the other municipalities in, like, our, in our area doing this as well? That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, whatever you do is going to be yours. It's not going to be Jupiter's. I mean, you can try to mimic other people. Um, I think it's, I, I would, I would, if I may, I would change that a little bit and just ask, what do you, what areas have you been that you want to look like? You know, doesn't mean you think you are going to model yourself identically after them. You can have different types of architecture, certainly not the Alice Beach architecture that we were looking at a minute ago. Um, and just things that you can do that are, that are, the details that are specific to who you are, but you know, the the tested sound principles of planning are are, are kind of what we are. Um, you know, different cities do it in different ways. Sometimes it's too big. Sometimes it's too much. I mean, I you could go through lots of examples of where that was done unsuccessfully. I think, um, especially in larger urban buildings. You know. Um, but I think of like, um, you know, I, I've always been a fan of what the town of Jupiter, set, setting aside Abacoa, which I'm biased towards, but, um, you know, with some of the projects that came in along Military Trail after Abacoa, you know, they have a little bit of parking between Military Trail and the buildings themselves, but they still have a presence on the street. You know what I mean? Um, so I think it's up to you, you know, but I wouldn't forsake creating walkable, you know, uh, interesting places because you're worried about looking like somebody else. No, I totally agree with that statement. I, I know you didn't say that, but. But I think, go ahead. Look, see, I think Beverly's a, a really good important part, and, and I think of where we are in the quest, I think we kind of lead, or I feel like we are the leaders in this little palazzo area that we are in, even though it's part of the Jupiter not incorporated in Palmish County, we're in Martin County for more roads. But I feel like when you came here from West Palm Beach, how did you know you came, you were in the Tequesta area? How did you know? Was it at what point on your route here, was like, oh yeah, we're, I'm there. For me, it's when I cross a bridge. It's like, okay, I'm home. I know that I'm just across the bridge. Okay, we're there. It's, it's, this, is, this is it. And it's, it's a different feeling that I get. I'm not sure if anybody else experiences it, but that's. I experience that and then tree road when you come in from the north end, but sure. also I'm not being towered over by buildings either. So that's what we're trying to have that same experience without losing it because we're mimicking something else. Maybe. Mm -hmm. That's hard. And I think some of the details in later comments is like, there's nothing about different sign injunctions or materials or are we going to require planners and I mean just kind of little nitty gritty, which I don't even know if we can like it's guidelines. But I don't know if some of these things we could even enforce. So maybe just a little more like finite details of like what. Make, make us stand out a little more than other areas that are doing the same thing. So 
you asked you asked a tough question. That's a very good question that both of you combined. I mean, how do you know as an outsider? How do I know that I've hit to question that I'm in to question? Well, I know I'm getting there because of that freaky intersection. <laughs> um, to me, the most memorable when I was in Tequesta, you know, the most memorable part of being Tequesta to me is um, there's Seabrook and Tequesta Drive. Inside the heart. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it, it could be it, it, we could make Dixie look like that, and, and that's everybody has to go through Dixie at some point to come to you know, Eastern. And that's why I love I love the idea of the roundabout, but so much more or as much. I love the idea of building a um, a median on Old Dixie with with trees, have a landscape median because when you look down Old Dixie, when I do anyway, it looks like uh, a runway at an airport, and it's dry and crusty. It's not green at all. It just looks awful. So it's a splash of rain anyway. Sure, that's true. Part of the conversation with the county many years ago about what do we do right. with them or, or have them do it on behalf to improve old Dixie. But I think on the time your comment about coming over the bridge, that's the way I always felt too when I came over the bridge and saw the lighthouse. But I also think it should index all that area too. I yeah, I'd, I'd love to see everything north of the river be Tequesta. But the other thing is, you know, you said, well, when, it's when I got to Tequesta Drive at Seabrook, I'd like people to know it before they get to that core right. place. So I think when you look at, when you're coming up US-1, and we talked about the need for landscaping, as you come up to US-1 and you cross the Beach Road, as you come in from the north, uh, as you come up Old Dixie, um, and I know we inquired about what the railroad, or the cement company intends to do with its property along the railroad, but you know, all those, all those avenues that lead in, as soon as you hit that sign that says Village of Tequesta, there should be an immediate impact, like, hey, there's something different about this place. Yeah. And that's what we don't, we don't have that now. Right. And, and so what you're doing creates it within, we still need to do some work on you know, that initial entrance into the village, I think. Well, what I was also gonna say, though, um, and this, this may not be very popular with everybody, and I'm certain it's not, but another thing that I noticed is that you all actually went the, the distance and reduced your US-1. Um, that is a big, big deal because that enables you to do other things. So, you know, I think that what you've done is you've tightened that um, as it comes into town. And, right, and, the, and the reason that was done was potentially to try to create more of a boulevard effect um, so that you knew you were in a town, you just weren't on a, you know, a six lane highway. But you're also right, there were things that we had hoped to be able to accomplish, such as you mentioned, you know, this, the, the sidewalks and um, extending out where those bike paths are and, and having that all separate landscaped. But DOT didn't want to do that. DOT did not want to do right. the, the improved medians in the center of US 1. So there were the lighting, you know, we've got lighting south and north of Tequesta Drive that extends for a few hundred feet, but we wanted, you know, the nice lighting to run the entire lane. So, there were things we we had hoped to accomplish with DOT, but you know, at the time they said no. Sure. Well, that's kind of why you know we we kind of thought that that and again it's a long term thing and maybe it's right. but you know that east side where Tequesta Drive continues, you know that could also become green as well mm -hmm. in the corner southwest corner of Tequesta Drive and US One the old bank. What are the plans for that? Bank of America, I believe, unless Jeremy's heard something different, had a, a, a group of properties that they were looking to sell. I believe, or, 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 yeah, I believe there's some, been some inquiry as to whether they would sell it separately from the rest. Um, I know at least one developer that, that would like to, to pursue that, but I haven't heard that they were willing to do that at this point. And then PNC has closed their location as well. The Bank of America is a key, key location. I heard that was going to be another Starbucks. Well, you know, that one's big enough. They're going to have a parking garage here, too. <laughs> you got a three level Starbucks. Yeah, let's do McDonald's. Okay, three levels. Okay, I have a couple more comments. Yeah, for sure. 
Another word that I feel like we need as a whole, as a group and for the residents, is just work on the cohesiveness too. So if we do one thing with one room, kind of try to keep tying that into the other one. So that you, like Kyle was saying, you feel like the whole time you're in Tequesta, that you're in Tequesta. You'll feel Lights when you off. exit the county Sounds line light at US1, you'll yeah. feel the exit. So I just I keep always coming back to cohesiveness each, with everything the style the design the layouts the heights the densities the cohesiveness for me is a big one the uses the street facing uses like don't go residential commercial residential that's difficult yeah it's, I think we should be cohesive um, and I think most residents can even relate to cohesiveness because especially in the female world I mean you might have your own style but you have a piece for every time of the day and every type of event yet you can still see the style of that person. Maybe I should. All right. A um, couple more comments on the um, specific open space. Um, I am in favor of the civic open space. I think that's a good idea. So I would say I'm in favor of that one. Um, the drive throughs I gave this some thought. You know, I don't know that banning them all together is necessary, but I, I'm really for being very strategic about where they go. You know, I mean, I was disappointed with the Starbucks drive through location. Um, and you brought up the whole franchise thing, and I talked to Keith, the, our attorney, about this, and he's not here, but the way I understand it is it's really hard to outright ban franchises, but you can do an overlay district of where the only place you allow them. But part of me is like, well, US1 might be that place. Like, we don't want them on to quest at Seabrook, right? So I'm kind of like, if we did an overlay, where would it be? It would be on US1. So I, I don't know if that's a topic that council wants to discuss or... So I'd be in favor of doing an overlay on Seabrook and Tulsa County. For franchises? Not allowing them on the question. Yeah, I thought you said allowing them. No, 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 I totally disagree with that. Yeah, yeah, no, sorry. Please, like, oh, man. Here we go. On the universal side. Universal side. You know, um, okay. Okay. You know um, I don't mean to belabor, but not all of US 1 is the same. So maybe when you're at the center of town, maybe there's a quarter mile radius from Tequest to Drive in US 1 that, you know, it's not permitted, but maybe to the south and to the north it is. I don't know, just, you know, it helps you to focus and concentrate on the center of town. Just something to think about. Well, when we talk about a franchise too, how are we defining that? Because for example, we have Marshalls and yes. Homegoods, which is exceedingly popular. Now, you could call that a franchise. So you got, you, you got to be very careful about the definitions that we- And you also have bank drive-ins. Yeah. Let's remember that. It, it's a slippery slope, you know. I don't want to pick on our favorite island community, but it's, um, you know, it's. I I I struggle with it. I struggle with it a lot. Um, I also used to work for a retailer too, who was big into nationals, and said, you know, it's strategically placed. They they spend, you know, a hundred thousand dollars a year more than the mom and pop store advertising, and they bring people in. You know, there are benefits to having national tenants as well. So I guess, I mean, is there any appetite of council to look at overlay? I mean, Ben Harris said so. I wouldn't. I mean, is that, I mean, is that something you guys could suggest, like where, just based on what you saw, where you think those areas would be best to the franchises? Yes. You look at that. I would only because, again, going back to the cohesive look of the village, a lot of the bigger chains are going to have, they're going to ask for at least the majority of their look. In. So it was great that Starbucks came in and they are trying to mold the building to kind of fit here, but essentially like, their signage is going to be very standard commercial and corporate. And so is Dunkin' Donuts when Wendy's used to be there. You could tell it's a Wendy's. It's a corporate chain that's absolutely going to want to look. Forgive me, where, where's, where's, where's Starbucks going? Where's the old Seattle's Bank, right? Your village means US 1. Are you one of those pockets that not like the old Jack Creams? It's the, pop, it's the public shopping center. Oh, where Village meets US 1. Okay, yes, yes, yes. I mean, 
Would you consider that the periphery? It's better to go there than yeah. at truest, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, it, I think it's the, the, the most retail-centric part of, of all of the rest of the provinces. Um, and then on the frontages and, and the types, you know, I think, I think you mentioned you would probably, or I don't know if you need our feedback on, I mean, they're all very nice and where, you know, what the best place to identify the different streets and where each frontage would be, you know, a good placement for. Um, I mean, is that something you're gonna suggest or are you looking for us to? No, that's something we can suggest. Okay. Um, What's, what's occurring to me now is that what we need to do is develop something that we call a regulating plan. You have your zoning map, which tells you where the zoning districts are, but it, it's, I'm speaking a little bit out of school, not out of school, but I mean, usually a regulating plan will replace a zoning map. It's a zoning map plus, plus, plus. It'll tell you where like required retail frontages are, or where certain types of building frontages go, or you know where certain civic open spaces require, whatever, you know? So we need to map that. We haven't mapped that. And so we will map that um, and then start to key that to where we recommend certain frontage types go, um, you know, key sites for civic open space in the future. I mean, you know, the, the Bank of America would be an ideal little corner there potentially. So we'll build that, I think, which, <coughs> which will I think go a long way on helping to inform the changes to the plan. Okay. Yeah, and I don't know if it's too nitty gritty, but like I said, any so like signage, kind of guidelines, um, you know, like planner treatments and storefronts. You know, if you can't do a balcony, do you do a Juliet balcony? Like, I don't know if that's too nitty gritty, but just some options. Because um, I know, I mean, I have a friend, there's one specific plaza, the font on the sign drives her bananas. <laughs> so it's like, it's just, I mean, it's funny the things that people will comment on that I get comments on. So it's, you know, you have guidelines and signage, so they're not, we don't want them all to look alike, but just like with architectural features, like here's a five different signage types we would recommend you to choose from. Like I said, just to have that more cohesiveness, not everything going to match, but um, an opinion. And then I am not, I know we have some of the mid-century modern here. I don't know if I'm a fan of that forward um, but uh, the rest of the styles I like and I think maybe if there's any other options you could suggest because I remember looking at the Delray book I think they had like six or seven different architectural because I think having three or four I, mean, I don't know if anyone has any other inputs on the different architecturalizations but I'm not in favor of putting handcuffs on the design side of things I'm just I think from the village we control our own look control our own streetscapes, control that side of thing. Any kind of yeah, when I think of cohesiveness and continuity, I'm, like just to, to piggyback what you were saying, I, if we're going to do streetscapes uh, on, on this road, then we should apply it to this road and this road. That's what's going to keep the cohesiveness, not the exact same uh, architectural style. I agree with In you. fact, that's when it becomes a little Too much canned, yeah. which, you know, so That's when you get Hilton. Yeah, it looks like an HOA. Yeah, well, and something. that's why I agree. I feel like we can't just have, like, if we're doing design guidelines, like, to me, like, three aren't enough. Like, you need more we, to have a more variety. So, party. this is a slippery slope. The idea is not to regulate that you must do one of these styles. So when we it's ever special. first started a long time ago doing design guidelines, it was because architects trying to be creative were mixing Mediterranean Revival and Florida Bungalow <laughs> and twisting things into this mud. And the idea, you know, one idea, one approach for design guidelines is if you are going to do an Art Deco building, these are the pieces that make up an Art Deco building. If you're going to do a Florida bungalow, these are the pieces that make it up. If you're going to do Mediterranean Re Revival, this is it. You know, choose what you want, you know, but do it right. Um, I guess my question to you is that, you know, are there additional styles that are missing? Are there ones that we should get rid of? You know, I, I recognize that we're really focusing on commercial corridors and the mid-century modern and the ranch that we showed really applies to single family. We had a, a very brief discussion during the charrette about 
you know, maybe identifying different historic buildings and neighborhoods, but I don't know that there's a time All the way back to 1957. Sorry, right. that Manny believe me. <laughs> hey, hey, with, with that said, <clears throat> using these as examples, if you come to us and say, hey, here's what I want to build, and you go, it looks a lot bigger than what I saw. It's going to look like this or something like this. If someone came in and said, I want to build something different than what we've already talked about, we could at that point go, okay, let me see what it is that you're talking about. Sure. And go, oh, that's not sure. what you said you were going to build. The way it works in Delray Beach is they identified five or six different styles that they felt were appropriate for downtown. It's not law that you have to do them. They've got a backwards way of doing it. Um, if I decide I'm going to propose a building that's not like any of these, um, let me back up. If I am designing a building that meets one of these, I don't have to go for a board, you know, for design approval. If I'm deviating from this, I got to go to a board and explain why. Not that I can't do it, I just got to have a good reason why. Um, I still want them to come to the approval process. Come to the council, provide a concept, let us provide feedback, work with Nilsa. I, I, again, the process that we've had, we've worked really, really well. We've had developers have been very responsive, but I. I think it needs to be incumbent upon them to come to us and say, okay, this is what we're thinking about. Give us your feedback, give us your input. And part of you can manage that workload that's yeah. required for this area. I, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much, but I would tell you that the, the details of your architectural style aren't your biggest problem. Your biggest problem is getting the buildings in the right place, having the right frontages, having the parking in the right place, and getting the streetscape. Okay, if there's no more council comment, I'd like to open for public comment. Mm -hmm. Any other comments from the public? Mm -hmm. okay, how about I'll just start and we'll go around. Does that work? Okay. Can I just start small? I really encourage you to do the roundabout, do something at the intersection. It's terrible. But please focus also on the lighting. There's no lighting on Old Dixie, and I think it's really very necessary. And my second comment, as this is being talked about. You know how small Sequesta is. We need to do something um, better in the PR department when any of this starts getting really out into the public to make it comfortable for our current existing businesses. A lot of them have been there a long, long time. We're not after your business. This is not what this is about. Be sure we get that message across. OK. Um, Maybe we should consider going to the federal government and see if they're interested in selling that piece between the library and the beach. And then um, we own the property the library sits on. So that would be nice to get that. And it never hurts to say, would you like to get rid of it? Um, the problem with variances, if you give one to somebody else, the next person's going to want it. So. I would suggest you try to stay away from variances. I said the drive throughs aren't just Wendy's. They're banks, and a lot of people need drive throughs through banks. Um, and the other thing, just a personal thing, for a long, long time ago, we had a community appearance board, and I was on it. It's now been integrated into planning zoning. And we had the Spanish look. That was what that council at that time said they wanted, tile roofs, they wanted that buff color. And so a lot of what you're seeing that you don't like now was stuff that we voted on at the time. So I get really, you know, everybody's got a different style. I like the idea of Frank that you bring it, you give somebody a general idea of what you're looking for. You know, you don't want something that's bright red or the that building in Riviera that looks like the rainbow. Sunset building. Yeah, but you know, you can you can say we're looking for muted tones, we're looking for something that's not too crazy, you know, and then be open, and that would be my suggestion. And you might want to consider bringing CAB back. <laughs> I think Sequesta is a really unique place, and what draws people to the area is the walkability. I think people like to be outdoors, and you know, keeping that in mind as the priority of like how do we create that? We really don't have that many outdoor dining opportunities if you think about it. So when you're setting up businesses and frontages and setbacks, I think that should be a major consideration because the restaurants, you know, we have a lot of really good restaurants for such a small area, and I think our population serves it, 
people coming to the town serve it, and they've done well with outdoor dining. So how do we encourage that and increase it and make it available? Just in whatever we're doing, um, walkability serves every population. You know, we have elderly people, we have a lot of families. I think all of those things are important. And again, to your point of using the word cohesive, when you're walking, you want to feel like it's a cohesive walk. You're and also an ingress and an egress safety issue as well as a pedestrian more ingress and egress you have into every parcel, if they start to get subdivided, it's going to become a problem. Um, so things like that, um, just to keep in mind, I think you might want to make like a priority list because it sounded like everyone was really scattered going in a bunch of different places. And I think it makes your job easier if you're like, you know, priority is walkability and then this and then that. And then I think the plan will expand from there further. Um, so I've said this before, I'll say it again. So I've been here going on 40 years now, and I have a lot of friends and colleagues that live in the central part of the county, and I worked there for many years. And when people would ask me, where do you live? I'd say, it's a quest. And they'd say, oh, I love, it's so green. It's so, you know, the water, it's the green. It's the first thing I've heard all these years. It's green. They love the green. And that is what you accomplish with streetscapes. And don't be afraid to go ask, because 35 years ago, when I was village manager, the council wanted us to go and knock on doors on US-1 and see if they would give us, I think the terminology was a limited access easement, the words to that effect, where people, we could plant trees and irrigate them, and we would maintain them, the village. And to my surprise, I thought, oh boy, this is going to be a waste of time. They did it. The <laughs> shopping centers were open to it. There was a little way. Everybody did it. Now, the trees are all dead now. I don't know why. <laughs> but I mean, I left in 2000, and they were still alive when I left. So I don't know what happened. But um, they will do it. And maybe some of those things are still existing today. I'm very, I'm very pleased that Dana made it very clear that when you're talking about what you folks call Paradise Park and I call the Village Center Master Plan Area, that it is sacrosanct that Main Street remain. It is sacrosanct. You cannot give up right away or you will regret it for eternity. That's sacrosanct. I have loved the idea of what he's proposed for Bridge Road. I thought it was necessary for years and then that, that Center Street uh, Bioswale is a wonderful idea because I can tell you from my own experience that when it's a heavy rain and it flows down the slope to Old Dixie and it heads down to the valley by the water, the cement plant, that is a major cause of flooding, okay? And you've got to capture that water. Um, this is a question. So I'm confused about the following. When I read the prologue, the staff report that started off the attachment for this master plan. Molly's got it open right there on the screen. Um, the staff enumerated what was the content of the contract between the village and Treasure Coast for this work. And what was not in there was design guidelines. And subsequent to the charrette, council members have said repeatedly, well, I don't want to do this or I don't want to do that until such time as I know what the design guidelines are from the Treasure Coast. So my question is, are we actually going to get written design guidelines, which is related to the following? Those four, five, or six concepts, West Indies, mid-century modern, et cetera, that are in the draft, I wasn't clear was that intended to be the design guidelines, but when Dana said the following earlier, I thought it made perfect sense. If you want to do West Indies, here's, here's a picture of what it looks like, and here's the things that we would require you to do, okay? And so on and so forth, and you go down that line. Um, I like that, but we still have got to have, you know, English language words that say this is what you have to do or consider when you're doing it. So I'm kind of confused. When are you going to get design guidelines that you can actually put in a code? Or are you? Maybe not. That's it. Thank you. Uh, 
Um, well, I'll use the C word for commending you for the consistency I hear about being cohesive. Um, you mentioned the entrances. You, know, you mentioned Coral Gables. If you go to Coral Gables, you can enter from many places, and they're pretty consistent and cohesive in the entrances, you know, Mediterranean style or whatever it is down there. But here, um, you know when you're in Tequesta on a residential basis because a prior manager, uh, um, <laughs> on Country Club Drive, she come in from Martin County. That was... The residents there many years ago came to council, and I think Tom was pretty in touch with that. But the speeding was going on in there. You know, it's a 25 mile an hour road, but like you said, a straightaway. So but the residents pulling out of their driveway, et cetera, et cetera, safety issues. And a lot of trees were planted, and that had a attractive calming effect. But it's, I encourage you then to have a very long term outlook on this because those trees were pretty small when they got put in. And today when you come in to Tequesta, you know you're in Tequesta coming from Martin County, at least in one entrance that I know. And you see those trees over the road. And that was very long term effect if it was a long term case. So I encourage you to do that. Thank you, Lawrence, for the feedback. That's really great. Picking up on one thing Molly said, because the Cypress Strive Tequesta intersection I we all got that email. Um, I do think that's something we need to take a look at in, in that north section of Cypress. The other thing, the other road that I think is concerning is this county line road, which is Martin County, uh, Palm Beach County owned road. But again, that is the northern border, and we haven't really talked about that. But again, it, it's the northern definition of Tequesta, and I would add that too. The, Streetscape that we need to consider as, as an area for enhancement. That's what it's saying. Right. That's what that's what's made all night. I mean, completely forgot it. I'll turn around and run. There, there are some rough spots up there. We don't even have sidewalks on our side. I, if I may, uh, Jeremy has tasked the, the EAC with coming up with streetscape. We've done about uh, in September, we will tell you what we recommend for the existing and then. By October, you will have the Environmental Committee's recommendations on where, I can tell you this right now, Old Dixie's numero uno, but the other areas that we think should also be addressed, and I'm pretty sure county line roads can be. Mayor, thank you. So I think, um, and Mr. Bradford kind of alluded, you had next steps on one of your slides, but now that you have all the feedback, could probably put together an actual schedule because I'm sure your timeline was based on how much feedback you get from us. So I guess yes. the next steps would be, you know, put an actual timeline and send it to Jeremy so he can send it to us. We can kind of get a, a better idea of um, the end game when it's going to be done. And I mean, I, I feel like probably we at least have that one or more presentation. <laughs> this Friday. 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 This Yeah. 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 Yeah.